at the end of the day, speed, athletic performance, athleticism, jumping ability, it really comes down to the ability to generate force quickly, rate of force development and max force development. So how fast you can create a, a big force. So how high I can jump is directly determined how fast and how much force I can put into the ground. If I wanna run this way really fast, I gotta get force going into the ground this way really fast. So it's angular uh, angles of force, force vectors, and the rate of force and the amount of force. Well, I'll do a brief, brief introduction for those who you that don't know Bill as well as I do. Internationally recognized expert in youth speed training who shares his enthusiasm and passion for sports performance training through presentations to business owners and athletes and coaches every year. Since 1992, more than 1 million athletes have trained through the Parisi training system in over 100 facilities in health and fitness clubs worldwide. In 2001, he built a flagship facility, which is where we are today, that's been home to more than 250,000 athletes and hundreds of professionals in every major sport. The facility has become synonymous with world-class training, and in 2009, Men's Health named it one of the top 10 gyms in the country. By 2004, he opened his fourth facility and soon realized to have a positive impact on as many youths as possible, it was time to launch the program nationally through a franchise. By 2009, the Parisi Speed School had expanded to over 50 locations in the US. The franchise would go on to be named the Franchise Times Fast 55 list, and the Entrepreneurs Magazine Top 50 New Franchises. Serving as, as a consultant and featured lecturer for several sports-related organizations, including the NFL, Nike, Reebok, and numerous sports industry associations. In addition to speaking, writing, and consulting, Parisi has been featured on ESPN, The Today Show, New York Times, and many more and also the Escape Your Limits podcast. So please welcome to Escape Fitness Now and the Parisi Speed School headquarters, Mr. Bill Parisi. Let's give him a big Thank hand you. up. That was a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Did I miss anything? No, I, I haven't heard that one in a long time. That's a, well done. Again, Escape once again at the highest level. Well, Bill, I, I, I think probably a, a good place for, for, for myself and, and, and for the guys listening is, um, is, is how did this start? You know, what, what was the, the young Bill Parisi motivated and inspired from to sort of go on and, and become this in later life? Uh, great question, Matthew. Often asked that question a lot, and it was really my biggest challenge, uh, became my biggest uh, learning experience and opportunity. So I was a young athlete in high school, competed in football, American football, and then coach said, go out for track and field to get faster for football. I was a little undersized, so I went out for track. The coach in track had me try all the events, uh, took a liking to the javelin throw, and uh, started throwing the javelin and playing football. By my senior year, I was a nationally ranked high school javelin thrower, and I got invited to a national meet, the Keebler International, where the top two place finishers make the U.S. Olympic team to compete in the Junior Olympics, and that year it was in Tokyo, Japan. That was 1985, and I was in second place. I was so excited. There was one thrower left with one throw, and all I wanted was that USA sweatsuit to go represent my country in the Junior Olympics, and on the last throw, I was beat by two inches. I was devastated, and... Um, after going through a mourning period, I said, I'm never going to let that happen again. So I went on this quest to learn everything I can on how to become a better javelin thrower. And not knowing and realizing back then, but to be a really good javelin thrower, especially at five foot ten and being Italian, right? Because most great javelin throwers are six foot five Norwegians, right? Swedes, you know, Germans, you know, all different, you know, European countries. I had to get really fast because to throw the javelin far, a seven foot spear, you're only 5'10", you gotta run real fast down a runway, so you need speed, and then you gotta stop yourself really quick. With one step, you gotta come to a stop and transfer all that linear speed, all that force you're generating, all that power through your body, through breaking yourself, really like tripping yourself, if you will, through your body, through your core, through your upper body, and then into your hand to create hand speed and throw it really far. So I started going to seminars around the world as a, as a young athlete in college. I went to Finland uh, in the summer of 1989 because Tapios Kuros won the gold medal in the javelin in 1988. And I learned very young, if you want to be the best at something, find out who the best in the world is and model them. Copy them, right? That's what I did. 
I went to Finland because they're the best javelin throwers. Historically, they produce great javelin throwers. Went there for a summer as an exchange student. Started learning all these great techniques, training techniques, back in the 80s, where every gym in America back in the 80s were, was like a Planet Fitness. They were all Nautilus and rows of cardio equipment and, and selectorized equipment. That was really the big, that was it, right? And then some free weights. This is the 80s now. And then I realized, man, what I'm doing, what, how I'm training, medicine ball training, functional training, all this stuff I learned as a javelin thrower, um, this is really helpful for all athletes in field and court sports. So I went on to become a, a two-time Division I All-American, and not bad for a North Jersey Italian who's supposed to be making pizza <laughs> or you know, laying brick or giving high-interest loans for cash, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, if you watch The Sopranos, right? Um, but the reality of it is, you know, achieving that success as a, as a you know, undersized athlete um, and, and, again, realizing all that type of training, improving speed, athleticism, I realized, you know, all field and court sports can benefit from the type of training I learn. And then when I was in college, I continued to go to seminars and educational events and and then I started the business right out of college. You know, as soon as I graduated, I got, I got right into it. I did a year at the University of Florida. I was a GA for their, their football and track teams, a strength coach. Came back and uh, started out of a van, out of my parents' basement, um, you know, out of a small office and driving around in a van with no facility, $50,000 in debt. You know, I come from a real modest family, old school Italian family, only want to go to college. Got an older brother, older sister, younger sister, only want to attend college. And uh, blue collar, worked hard and saved some money and then opened my first facility in 1993, uh, which is still in existence today, only five miles from here. And um, we, we grew that from a small little 3,000 square foot facility. In 1993, we, we grew it to 3,500 square feet, a little bit bigger. And in that facility in 1997, we did 927,000 in revenue in 1997 uh, as a performance-based functional training facility in, in 97. So we, we've been doing it a, a long time, training, you know, adult functional training based and then youth athlete based. But we've le always led in with youth athlete training, as you guys see uh, across the side of the gym here. Right. Coaching and mentors seems to have been a big influence. Obviously, it's, it's what got started your business. And my guess is that you've been in front of and been coached and mentored by a number of wonderful people. Um, what have you learned separates great coaches from average coaches? Delivery. You know, understanding how to master the delivery. And I think that goes across any, any you know, relationship or coaching relationship, whether it be coaching an adult, coaching an athlete, a pro athlete, a young athlete. At the end of the day, there's one magic word that everybody wants, and it's more confidence. You know, at the end of the day, competency builds confidence. And you, you build someone's confidence through communication and through enhancing their competencies. And, uh, you know, great coaches really understand the art of communication. They understand, you know, EQ, the emotion quotient, right? Where, you know, where I like, a lot of people I feel in this industry, you know, they, they get hung up on, on IQ or training knowledge. That's important. Don't get me wrong. I value education tremendously. My whole company is based off, you know, scientific peer-reviewed, evidence-based education. But the delivery of that information to an athlete to inspire your client, to inspire your, your athlete is really important. We're not necessarily in the uh, fitness business. We're really in the motivational business because not many people on this planet are, are motivated, right? The top few percent are self-motivated. We all know that. They come to you. They come to us for motivation as much as the information, right? And, and the information is important you got to have sound training information. You got to have great equipment and great facilities. That all is is good, but the motivation is 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 important. You mix the both, and then then you become legendary in what you do. Part of a, the success of a licensed business and a franchise is people. It's a people business, and I, in my business relationship with you, Bill, I've learned that you've been pretty good. Um, well, very good at identifying talent and people that have the ability to go and run and to set things up. What, what are some of the things that you use, I guess, consciously when you're looking for someone to be able to run with a program or a business? Are there any personal skills that you look out for and you say, yeah, if somebody's got that, then, then they're going to make 
the right type of person? And are there any things that you see as potential red flags? Yeah, I mean, someone, uh, most importantly, is, is accountability, right? Someone that's accountable to themselves. Someone that's going to, they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. Um, and, and that's, you know, the most important element. You know, honesty, trust, our core values are, number one core value is, is honesty, right? And we, we talk about that all the time. We, we kind of, when we do our trainings and we bring people in, we bring coaches in, we say, hey, our number one core value is honesty, right? We're going to be honest with you. And we hope everyone in the room is honest. You know, if, you, if you're honest, raise your hand, right? And everybody raises their hand, right? Then we say, okay, that's great to know. Tell us the last time uh, you told a lie, right? So, so honesty is something you always are working on, right? If you said, oh, I never told a lie, um, you're probably not being honest, right? <laughs> and honesty, and our second core value is being positive, but honesty is not always positive. Right, so you know they they kind of you know they don't always uh, go hand in hand, and honesty is is hard at times, especially with say an owner trying to approach a really nice, you know, employee trainer, but it's not pulling their weight, right, or or you know not doing the things they should be doing to grow the business. Um, it's 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 hard, and you got to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, so we look for people that are accountable, that are honest. Uh, that have a track record of that, have a track record of execution and getting things done, um, and, and, and somewhat personable, right? I mean, the training knowledge, we can teach them that. I mean, we've had house painters, bank tellers join our program that uh, UPS workers that now train professional athletes worth tens of millions of dollars, you know, people that have completely changed careers. And they don't, you know, they don't have to understand the Krebs cycle. Right, you know, they have to understand the basic biomechanics of movement. They have to understand how to keep people injury free. They have to understand risk factors, you know, knowing someone's history and just using a lot of common sense. Right? If you understand basic biomechanics and you understand how the spine works, I think it all originates from the core and the spine. If you have good spine mechanics, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna figure a lot of things out when you're training someone and making sure they're staying safe and creating just movement. We just don't move enough, right? So we don't need to overcomplicate. I feel that what's made us successful over the last 30 years, growing our brand, is is making it simple, you know, an, an easy way to duplicate a system that other coaches can get behind, feel confident about, and deliver that information in an enthusiastic way, right? You know, you look at McDonald's, and it amazes me whenever I go to an airport. McDonald's is always busy. You know, it's like, and I say to people, hey, you know, McDonald's, you know, if you were to have a party, like a barbecue at your house, like, would you get McDonald's hamburgers and serve them? Or would you, like, grill your own burgers? And most people say, no, I would go get my own. I can do a much better job than that. I'll go buy these great patties from the butcher and grill them out. You know, are you out of your mind? I'm like, so you can make a better hamburger than McDonald's? And people look at me like... You know, and these are coaches. They're like, yeah, all right, then what are you doing here? Well, go open up a hamburger shop, right? Go, go right next to them. And they say, uh, and I say, well, the challenge is, is their delivery system. Like, they know how to deliver product. You know what you're getting out of McDonald's, and they have mastered the delivery system. And in our industry, we have to understand the delivery of our product, the delivery of our service. Like, you have to make that, if you make that really powerful and flawless, Man, you're going to be successful. Now, you can't get people hurt. If you have good biomechanics and you master the delivery, you're going to be successful and motivating and inspiring. And that's, you know, that's the magic. We, we created a simple delivery system in the Parisi training. Um, well, I kind of say it's simple, but, uh, you know, if you go through it and, and you learn it, you know, because we teach speed. So speed can be a little bit more complex, right? Acceleration, deceleration, maximum velocity, multi-directional speed, curvilinear running. There's a lot to unpack there, but we break it down to, you know, simple uh, components that, that coaches can get their arms around. And after a few months of training, you get comfortable, just like you do in the escape system. Introducing the next big thing in functional training, the escape barrow a revolutionary training tool that combines a loaded farmer's carry with a sled push to develop hip, grip, and core strength. 
Developed in partnership with Pete Holman, inventor of the TRX Rip Trainer and Nautilus Glute Drive, the Escape Barrow can be rolled, pushed, dragged and carried. The Escape Barrow packs a punch with an impressive load capacity of 440 pounds and with a two-stage galvanized paint covering process, it's also ideal for outdoor use. So head over to escapefitness.com forward slash barrow. That's escapefitness.com forward slash barrow to find out more. Enjoy the rest of this episode. One of the things I guess that seems as though it's a natural progression, and, and I think this is an important question for people to probably um, figure out, but also maybe not see it as a negative, is, is that sometimes it's like, okay, I'm a great trainer. I've probably got fantastic clients and I've interviewed many that, that are really in that field. But there's, there's almost seems this, this sort of idea that the next place that you go is to own your own business and yeah. to open a, a, a chain. You've dealt with fantastic trainers, world-class trainers, that have trained world-class athletes. You've worked with very successful business people. Talk a little bit about the difference between a fantastic trainer and a business person. Can these be the same people? Is that a natural progression? Or, or, or sometimes, you know, is it worth you know, looking at where your strengths are? That's, that's a great, great question because, you know, first you have this fantastic trainer and you have this fantastic business owner. Can they be the same people? They can, but not at the same time. They can be the same person, but it's really hard to be that at the same time. Be that great, great trainer and that, and that business owner. So that doesn't mean you still can't do both. I still get my hands dirty training, but you know, it's a, you know, five hours a week, right? That I'm, I'm staying in it and I'm still doing the research and studying. I'm in it enough to kind of still relate to it and be able to do education, right? Um, and, and I think the same holds true for, for anyone. You know, you just done enough hours in the day because to be a great business owner, your time is spread out really empowering other coaches and, and, and building those relationships and, and, and managing the, the process of your business, you know, understanding and knowing the financials. I think the biggest challenge with people in this industry is we're all great people. We want to help people. We got into this industry because we want to empower other people. Fitness is our passion. Um, you know, we're not like behind the desk, you know, finance people looking at numbers. You know, typically that's not your, you know, your, uh, your, your, your coach or your trainer. Um, but if you want to be successful at this industry, in this business, you, you got you to gotta have that. And, and, you know, I know you might have your spouse that you trust doing it. You might have your, your high school buddy that was your best man at your wedding who's your accountant doing it. If, I don't care who it is. If you don't know it as an owner, it's not good. I've been in this a long time. Yep, I've seen best friends steal from best friends. I've seen wives steal from husbands. <laughs> I've, you know, I've seen wives leave husbands, you know, and say, where'd all my money go? Like, you got to know it. Like, things change. Things change. And, you know, I'm not saying, hey, I got a great, great relationship with my wife and all. I'm not saying yeah, I've never been divorced or whatever, but that doesn't matter. The point I'm trying to say is I've seen it. Like, I've seen it. I've seen things happen out there. You're like, holy cow, how did that happen? I've seen lifelong friends start a business together and then, you know, end in tragedy of mistrust when it comes to that stuff. So to answer your question, if you're going to own a business, you got to commit to understanding the mechanics, the financial mechanics of that business and the back-end operations of that business. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to run it. you got to understand it so you can look at it and evaluate it on a, on a you know, monthly, weekly, daily basis. And do you think sometimes, that, well, it, it, does that mean then that you have to accept that, okay, yes, I was a great trainer and I had some great clients, but you probably have to say, well, I'm going to sort of close that chapter to some extent and now I'm going to become the, you know, the business owner and I'm going to put other people in place to do what I used to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's possible, but, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily... Um, I think that's obviously very possible. I did it. And the point is, you, it's a paradigm shift. It's almost, okay, I'm taking to that next step. I've, I've come, I've been the coach, but now I'm going to be the mentor. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that next leap, and I'm going to mentor people to, to grow. And uh, sometimes, you know, people realize, ah, this is not nearly as much fun. <laughs> you, know? you know, 
worrying about the business or having the financial liability of the business, right? Um, but, you know, it, it, for some people it is fun, you know? So it really, you have to do a lot of soul searching and see what you really want as a coach. And, you know, it's a you know, natural progression to own a uh, location or to take on that, that opportunity to, to make more money and, and, and scale yourself, scale your skill sets to other coaches. Uh, but you have to be ready for it. I think emotionally, uh, financially, you have to be ready to we weather the storm. Uh, and you have to be, you know, you know, your family has to be ready for it because it's a bigger commitment. It, you know, it's just, it's a lot you need to do. But if you do it well, it's, it's rewarding. And one advice I will give, you always have to be on the lookout for talent. Like you always, if you own a business, you always have to be on the lookout for talent. No matter where you go, you run into someone. I was at, you know, um, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods many years ago, and my kids were very young. And, uh, you know, I was there buying some, you know, I think sneakers or whatever, or, you know, and the, and the attendant there selling that was really good, like very engaging. My kids were running around. They were like seven, eight years old, taking the basketballs, throwing them all over. And he was engaging with them. He was like, you know, getting them to calm down but had fun. I was like, wow, this guy's unbelievable. I said, wow, you're really great at what you do. Do you keep your career options open? And he says, sure, I do. Yeah, like, here's my card. You know, give me a call. Let's, let's get together. And that guy came, went on to be a, a great, great coach of ours. So he was happy to leave, uh, uh, you know, Dick Sporting Goods, you know, making 10, 12 bucks an hour at the time, eight bucks, whatever it was, eight, 10 bucks an hour, and come here to make, you know, 15, 20 an hour, you know, and he's, and he's doing what he did with my kids. He's coaching, right? And he only has, to, he's working, what, half the hours making the same amount of money and upside to make a lot more because our pay scale is more aggressive, you know? If you do really well and you get a big book of clients, you know, we're going to start you off at that bottom scale, but you're really good. You bring it in a higher gross, we're going to give you a higher hourly rate. So always be on the lookout no matter where you are. I picked up a bank teller, uh, you know, a, a customer service guy at, a, at, at Dick's Sporting Goods. I picked up a house painter, a guy that was painting houses, became one of our, our all-time best combine trainers. You know, just people with passion and accountability. Like passion and accountability. That is everything because... I don't care what they know, as long as they have passion and accountability and they have somewhat of an aptitude that they can learn and they're willing to be educated, dude, I can, I can make, we'll make you a superstar. And we, we, we've made tons of superstars here. Like, literally, we've made hundreds of, of superstars that have gone on to open up their own Parisi location or some have gone on to open up their own locations, you know, with their own names and stuff, which is fine, you know, um, but that's, that's what it takes. You've built an interesting niche around, uh, yeah, a niche, I would say, in, in a very competitive market. There's, there's all kinds of fitness studios and, um, uh, I suppose, athlete training centers. And there's everything, particularly in this part of the world where, where yeah. you guys are in. But you're focused on a really, really small niche relative to that, which is just speed. Um, it's in the name, Parisi Speed School. What, what, what was the thought process behind that? And is that something that you would recommend people that are thinking about a business to, to kind of really hone in on something and just be the best in the world at it? It's a great question. So when I first started the business, this is like one of those questions we, we give out at the annual Parisi Summit. It's like a quiz question. I'm gonna give you the, the, the <laughs> advanced answer here. So when I first started the business, when I first, first started the business back in 92, uh, the name originally, just for a very short while, I'm talking a month, was the Sports Conditioning Institute. How does that sound? Like, what is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? But so, there's quite a few of those around, I think. Yeah, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There used to be the Sports Training Institute in New York City back in the 70s. They kind of launched personal training. And we said, we're going to Sports Conditioning Institute. And then I had a woman um, that was you know, one of our clients, adult clients. She was in marketing. And she knew our focus was speed training, uh, you know. And she says, what are you doing? Like, that doesn't make sense. Why don't you just use your name? You have a cool Italian name. Ferrari, Lamborghini, Armani, you know. You have all these, you know, Italian names out there, especially with fast cars, right? And uh, pretty cool apparel, right? Uh, you know, use your name. And, and then you say, you know, yeah, the Parisi Speed School, because we educate our athletes, we educate our clients. And that's where, that's where the name was originated. Now, why speed? 
Well, speed is that one physical attribute that is uh, kind of, you know, mysterious, right? People don't really understand. It's like they don't kind of, back in the early 90s, people thought you can improve speed. There wasn't a lot of research showing that you can improve speed. Uh, but we, we go down the speed route because every field and court sport, the number one physical attribute for success, especially at the younger ages, is speed. There's never a really great standout athlete that's slow, <laughs> right? I've never seen really guys that, so especially at that youth level, 9, 10, 11, 12, the fastest kids are going to play. They might not be the most skilled, but they're going to be on the field. As you get older, as you get to high school level, freshman, varsity, now the skill becomes more important, but you still need to be fast, and it's still a huge factor. As you get into college and pro, now all those guys are fast. Like every, you don't make the team if you're not already fast when you go to college and pro. Like Everyone's fast. So you've got this, we call it the sports skill paradigm. So in sport, you have this foundation of athleticism. The foundation of successful athleticism, this pyramid, right? The foundation of the pyramid, because with a you know, poor foundation, the house falls down, is speed, strength, endurance, flexibility, confidence. You know, all those are the foundation, with speed being the critical foundation. And then as you move up the pyramid, you start to get into sports skill, like how to shoot a basketball, how to dribble, things like that become more important. You know, how, how to dribble a soccer ball. They become, you know, that's the next layer, right? But if you create that foundation of speed and strength and confidence, because to get faster, why we use speed? Speed is like people can relate to it. You know, oh yeah, speed, my kid needs speed. Yeah, speed, of course. But how do you get faster? Well, you know, number one way to get faster, you gotta get stronger. So you gotta get the right muscles stronger. And the number, you know, number one and number two, hand in hand, you got to get stronger, you got to learn technique. So you learn, you get stronger the right way for speed and you learn running mechanics, you're going to get faster. And as you get older and as you progress and your training age, you know, uh, increases with training, now you got to get that more dialed in. You know, then there's, there's, you know, force velocity curves and there's things that, you know, speed strength, strength speed. Um, there's things that we do now to manipulate you know, the, uh, the power output. So, but, but at, at the end of the day, speed, athletic performance, athleticism, jumping ability, it really comes down to the ability to generate force quickly, rate of force development and max force development. So how fast you can create a, a, a big force. So how high I can jump is directly determined how fast and how much force I can put into the ground. If I wanna run this way really fast, I gotta get force going into the ground this way really fast. So it's angular uh, angles of force, force vectors, and the rate of force and the amount of force. So that's really the essence of all athleticism is, is the ability to create force quickly, lots of force real quickly, whether it be into a, into a ball, if I'm a martial artist, into a punch, you know? I mean, we talk a lot about martial arts and people say, uh, you know, why would I bring my seven-year-old into a speed school? I want them just to enjoy sports. Of course, we want them to enjoy sports. So how do you enjoy sports? Well, not sitting on the bench and being, you know, you know, being kind of good at it, right? Unfortunately, a lot of kids in sports don't enjoy sports because coaches are out of their mind uh, and they're like ragging on kids and kids aren't participating or as much as they want and they're not the star. I mean, just to feel part of the team. Well, how do you get off the bench on the field? Well, learn how to generate force quickly into the ground so you can run faster. And how do you do that? Well, if I have a five-year-old kid, you wouldn't think twice bringing them into a martial arts class. Like there's a Taekwondo studio down the street. Yeah, I'm gonna bring my kid there for confidence. Great, it's, it's great, now what do you do? The kid starts out as a white belt in martial arts and he looks like this, right? And he's like his first day, he's, and he's like this punch, he's happy, he's feeling confident, and now he has a belt test, right? He's a white belt, now he wants to go and get his, his orange belt. So now he's looking like this, he's looking a little bit better, and he, when he gets his orange belt. If you go to a martial arts class three days a week for a couple years, now you're starting to get up there, you know, maybe a red belt, you know, purple, brown, black. Now all of a sudden the kids are like this, boom, 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 right? That's a lot different than this. Now what did that kid do for three years? Worked on movement mechanics. 
Did he lift weights? Did he do crazy? He did push-ups, he did body weight strength, and he learned how to generate force quickly through his hand, through his feet. We do the same exact thing at the Parisi Speed School. We're not trying to put force into an opponent. We're trying to put force into the ground at different directions to optimize our ability to accelerate, decelerate, run multi-directions, and run at maximum velocities. So it just we're, there are many forms of martial arts, right? Um, Gracie family came up with their own art, right? Well, there's an art to speed. We came up with a way to deliver it, just like a martial arts grandmaster developed a system to teach a different martial art. There's many different forms, Taekwondo, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, there's uh, Muay Thai, all these forms of martial art. Speed training is an art. We have a system to teach it. And the way an athlete can improve their martial arts ability, you can improve speed and athleticism. It's movement literacy, it's force development, rate of force development and movement literacy. Isn't that martial arts? It's movement literacy and rate of force development. Do you get kids doing martial arts in here just to help them understand and to, and to be faster at all? Yeah. I know you do some UFC stuff. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's more of the adult <laughs> stuff that we've done in the past, um, you know, with our colleague Martin Rooney when, when he was here uh, and his training for Warriors program. But I think what, what we, you know, we focus here really is, is really developing uh, our athletes on the field. We, we, you know, we really focus on um, the, the martial athlete. You know, like really creating that athlete that's really dialed in and, and uh, understanding movement. And, and that's a big part. We call ourselves the Parisi Speed School because it's built on education, like teaching the athlete, you know, the fundamentals of movement, you know, movement literacy, or we call their motor vocabulary, right? Just like when you bring someone in, in the gym to use your equipment, there, there's techniques on how to move that load, right? Well, the load is our body, so we want to know how to master and teach that, that movement. Right. When you started, what year was it started? 1992 was the official, uh, you know, was the official you know, incorporation of our business out of the van, and then 93 we opened our first facility. Right. You talk about your business is really education. What was the, what, what was it that you were learning and that the, the conversation was going with, sim, sim, with your peers back in 1992? Um, where was people's awareness about the human body, about speed? And, and are many of those principles still true today? And, and we'll go on to some of the, the fascist stuff in, in, in a moment, but ha, ha, are those principles still sound and we're still using a lot of that? Or has there been a major shift over that period, which is sort of you know, nearly 30 years now in terms of what people are teaching, what you're teaching and, and how you go about what you do? These are really great questions. I mean, this man is so well prepared, right? He's not only always well dressed, and even his sweatsuit is like, you know, cutting edge. Like he has these things that look kind of cool. That that ring is new, isn't it? Or is that that's a new my ring? aura ring, Bill? Yeah. Uh, it's, oh, it's an aura ring. Yeah. No, that's cool. Oh, it's, it looks good. Uh, just such great, great questions um, uh, in terms of you know the history. You know, it's ironic. No, our system hasn't changed much, and what's caught up was now the science has proven our system. Right. That was amazing, and it's so cool. Uh, I will say in the early days, there's a story. I was cold calling coaches here to get them involved in our program, and I called a, a famous coach. This was 30 years ago. He's been coaching for 40 years. And this coach I called just won his 300th game. He's been coaching for 40 years. He's the most successful, one of the top three most successful coaches in New Jersey football history. And uh, I called him up. I was new in the area. This was you know, probably 27 years ago. And I'm saying, I, you know, looking to help your team improve speed. It's like, what? Who? Uh, you're a charlatan and hung up. You know, he hung up on me. Like, just boom. You just thought, you know, yeah, you can't improve speed. This is some guy trying to sell snake oil, right? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that, that kind of set me back emotionally. Like, oh, wow, that was hard. But I kept plugging away, plugging away. Believed in our system. Had a free clinic where coaches came. He happened to come. He was actually saw what we did. Was kind of impressed. And then we wound up training his, his, his son and daughter along with his team. And um, I share that because the, uh, uh, the research is caught up with what we've been doing. Because again, when you think of martial arts, they've been around for thousands of years. What are you trying to do in, let's just use Taekwondo. What are you trying to do in Taekwondo? Generate lots of force through your fists and through your feet into an opponent and also blocking and, and moving quickly. We are the same thing. And, and athleticism is all about rate of force development. 
you know, how fast you can create force and how much force you can apply into the ground at the right angle to move your body a certain way. And that, that will never change. And our whole program has been built around movement literacy. Now, the science has, has, has validated speed can be improved through in getting stronger. Like, we know that from the research. If you get stronger, you're going to get faster. But now, recently, in the last 10 years or so, we've proven that there's a cap to strength. Like, once you reach a certain strength level, you know, it's not necessarily going to get you faster. So we've, you know, seen about two times your body weight in the squat. You know, if you get, if you can hit two times your body weight, 1.8 for women, if you can hit that number in the squat, uh, the back squat, parallel, you, you probably have enough strength and you don't need more strength to get faster. You need now the ability to uh, recruit that strength at faster speeds and you need to, you know, harness that strength in a way with better technique and you need to improve your force vectors into the ground technique, you know, applying force and how your body applies force. So if I want to generate a lot of force with my right arm into an opponent or break the wood the teacher is holding, you know, I'm not just going to use my right arm. I'm going to brace my body. I'm going to use my opposite side to, to you know, um, counter my punch. And there's a lot of things going on in this structure to maximize force. Well, the same thing when I run and I, I accelerate, the same thing is going on. I got to create proximal uh, core stiffness to create distal speed. You know, I've got to understand uh, in the gym, you know, rate coding and, and how to generate high motor unit recruitment and how to create pulses of stiffness in the body because speed is around creating uh, milliseconds of stiffness followed by relaxation. So uh, there's a lot of skill to being able to, you know, run fast because every time your foot strikes the ground, you want to be stiff, but in milliseconds, you need to be relaxed like as soon as your foot comes off the ground. So we're talking for world-class sprinters, eight hundredths of a second. For your average high school kid, we're talking about eleven hundredths of a second, you know, a tenth of a second, that they need to create a pulse of stiffness and strength. And that strength has to turn on and turn off really quickly. That's a skill. Hmm. You know, that's a skill. And knowing, knowing what that means and how to do that, the fascia system plays a big role in that. Co-contractions <laughs> play a big role in that. In that, in that athleticism of, of milliseconds of, of, of contractions and stiffness and co-contractions create this dynamic athleticism that we want. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of you know, understanding and training that goes around that. You know, I'm getting pretty deep here and I'm packing a little bit, but, but we keep it simple for the athlete mm. on, on how to, how to you know, attain that kind of athleticism. So it's, yeah, you need some weight room strength, but I think in our country, especially in the college level, it's become an arms race where they just have all these tons of uh, squat racks and whatnot. That's part of it. We've overdone it, though, I you know, feel, in, in, in the sports performance industry in terms of sagittal plane movements, squat, deadlift, you know, lunge, you know, uh, front squat, you know, all these, dead, all these sagittal plane movements you, you can easily overdo quickly uh, and lose that athleticism or that speed. If you take that elite athlete to the opposite end of the spectrum, someone like my mum, as people are getting older, is speed still an important um, skill to develop? And does that, if providing your training, is there sort of like a peak of max speed when you're, when you're sort of at your optimum level generally? And does it sort of drop off or can you sort of maintain it throughout your life? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, running speed, sprinting speed, yeah, that's going to drop off and, you know, about 27, you're kind of peaked out for most of us, you know, like you're, that's what, you know, history tells us at about 27, your running speed, your sprinting speed is kind of peaked out about that age. But overall, it's still something we can all work on. And it really comes down to the fascia system uh, and keeping that healthy to stay injury free, the connective tissue system, which, you know, I've done a lot of research on and did a pretty deep dive uh, in, in that area because, um, you know, that, that is more responsible for speed and athleticism and, and health and fitness and just living a pain-free life than we could ever imagine. And now the research is really piling, piling on very quickly around validating a lot of those statements. Mm. So prior, just probably just before the pandemic, you went out and had, I think, a, a lunch not far from here and you were telling me you were kind of gobsmacked, you were learning a lot of this information about fascia at the time. I think it was probably about three or four years ago. Yeah. And, and so, although probably some of the principles in your speed school may have been validated by research that you've got, have you 
Has there been a sort of a new understanding, a recent understanding about the fascist system that probably five to ten years ago most people weren't aware of? And if so, what what is that? Yeah, absolutely. Not only myself, but more and more people. And I find it, you know, really interesting. Well, this is a new frontier. So the fascist system is the largest sensory organ in the body, larger than the skin, has ten times more the proprioceptors than muscle. This is all proven by hard science, not soft science. So soft science is, you know, you listen open up the paper or you're, you know, hear, read an article and they say, oh, caffeine's no good for you. Two years later, caffeine is good for you. You know, eggs are no good, yellow, and the eggs are no, oh, no actually, they're good for you. That's soft science, you know, you back and forth, back and forth. And then there's hard science that, you know, hey, this is conclusive. So this is some, this is some hard science, you know, understanding the amount of proprioceptions in fascia, understanding it's the largest sensory organ in the body now, uh, understanding that it's trainable, that's 10% of it is, is cellular. 90% um, of it is uh, just pure collagen. Uh, it's the extracellular matrix. It's outside the cells. Without fascia, your body is, you know, your muscles are chopped meat. Without fascia, your muscles are pulled pork. Um, you know, it's what holds cells together. We know that, you know, to get more detailed, going back to your physiology books, you know, we absolutely, it's conclusive. We know we have the uh, 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 endomyosin around a muscle cell, right? We have the perimyosin wrapped around groups of muscle cells, and we have the epimyosin around the entire muscle. That's, those are fascia layers. And that, that fascia is, is collagen and water uh, with ground substance that, that makes this, you know, our body dynamic and springy. And without it, you know, we don't have spring, we don't have anything, we're just chopped meat. You know, it's this fascia that the muscles stretch and pull apart. And when I say fascia, I also mean tendons and ligaments, right? It's all the same collagen. Research shows about 80% of all tendons and ligaments in fascia are the same type of collagen. It's a protein molecules that make collagen non-living, non-calorie dependent. And uh, this is the stuff that, that holds our organs together. It wraps, our cell, it wraps cells, it wraps veins, arteries, um, you know, uh, nerves, and, and it's in between every muscle cell. It wraps groups of cells, it wraps entire muscles, it wraps individual muscles, groups of muscles, it's everywhere. So we didn't really understand it for the last 500 years because most anatomists would just disregard it, you know, do dissection and teach anatomy, and not, that's not the fun stuff. This is this packing material. <laughs> it's kind of like the stuff you get with the, open the Amazon box. It's like, it means nothing. It just holds stuff in place. That's what they thought, right? But no, it has a lot of nerve endings and it doesn't just hold stuff in place. It, it, it's a big pain conducer and uh, you know, it's, it's, it has a lot going on in it. And um, now we know it's, it's responsible for a lot of uh, athletic performance. So my colleague, Robert Schleip, who's a top German scientist, did an ultrasound on the right pec of Thomas Roller. Thomas Roller won the gold medal in the Javelin in 2016. He's a 290 foot thrower or a 95 meter thrower, 94 meters in the jab. He's big time, right? So he identified a three millimeter aponeurosis. That's a, that's a <laughs> three millimeter thick layer of connective tissue, tendon tissue, you know, fascia. Three millimeters on this side, a half a millimeter on this side. So he has this big elastic band <laughs> that came through his body. Why? Because over time, through mechanical transduction or David's law, putting a certain stress on the body, the body's gonna respond. And the body responded with these little spiders called fibroblast cells that literally are little slugs or spiders that crawl everywhere in your body. This is hard science, non-negotiable, that crawl everywhere in your body. You have millions, billions of them crawling everywhere, casting webs of collagen based on the types of stress you put on your body or the lack of stress you put on your body. Now, what do I mean by the lack of stress? If I sit at my desk all day and I operate like this, and after a while, I get stiff here. Now, if I do this for 20 years, I'm locked down here, and my posture is like this. Well, that's not just neural, you know, uh, hypertonic muscle. That's layers of collagen that have just been woven, and you're just physically stuck, and you're not going to get better unless you get somebody that really knows their stuff to break up that collagen. And that's because these spiders are, are, are casting webs. So if I sit like this all day at my desk, you know, with my legs crossed or like this, well, my, my right leg's externally rotated. When I run, I'm gonna tend to get this. And it could be very so slightly, you can't even notice in the naked eye. Put it on the video cameras, now all of a sudden, now you have a knee problem 
you don't know why. It's because you've been sitting a certain way all day. So I posture hygiene I talk a lot about. Just your, 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 your movement hygiene, you know, your sitting hygiene, everything, not just your spine, because we know, we know 80% of people on the planet have back problems. That's because you know, we, 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 we say, sit and bend a certain way and we actually do the opposite. We, we, we delaminate the collagen in our vertebral discs. You know, it's called the annulus fibrosis, the collagen that wrapped the vertebral discs inside is the nucleus propulsus, and that collagen that wraps it is called the uh, annulus fibrosis. And it's almost like the opposite, because we're sitting, we're rounding, and we're delaminating, opposed to strengthening. And how we strengthen, we keep good back hygiene, we load with carries, we do certain things to, to build that connective tissue to have a strong lumbar. Uh, so the science is pretty interesting in terms of connective tissues. Keith Barr has done a lot of research out of UC Davis. He did uh, ultrasound and MRIs of uh, uh, women soccer players, looked at uh, ligaments of the knee preseason. Certain, you know, there were a certain thickness, and then after the season, they actually became thicker and stronger, huh. you know, through stress. Um, so it, it's interesting. So connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, fascia is trainable, and if we train it the wrong way or we don't move enough or we sit a certain way, we are, we are creating this, this collagen matrix in our body to work against us. It's a, it's a big time pain uh, uh, transmitter and um, there's a lot of things going on in it in terms of um, we need to know in your training style, what you guys do at Escape really is important because it's multi-directional. So my good friend, Michelle Delcourt, which you know, um, you know, he was a strength coach for hockey athletes 20 years ago. He's getting his guys stronger traditionally through sagittal plane movements, squint, bo squat, bench, deadlifts, getting them really strong, goes to the hockey coach, how are my guys doing? Got to get them stronger around the puck, all right? Goes back, gets them stronger, benching more, squatting more, deadlifting more, how are my guys doing? Got to get them stronger around the puck. Who's beating my guys? The farm kids. Boom, the viper was formed, right? Like farm boy strength. If I had two wrestlers up here, same exact weight, same age, same training aptitude, you know, they had the same skill, but one kid grew up on the farm and one crew kid grew up in the city lifting weights. Who are you gonna bet on? Probably the farm kid, because there's just something different about their strength. He's just had a stronger grip. It's like that uncle who's a construction worker or that person you know who's a mason, you know, like what, what makes them stronger? It's their connective tissues. You know, it's, it's, it, they have much stronger, more dynamic, more connective tissue working for them, more dynamic connective tissue. One last thing I'll say about connective mm -hmm. tissue, they did research with kangaroos. They put kangaroos on treadmills, believe it or not, they measured force production, they measured speed, they also put them in lanes with fences on force plates, and they put uh, energy consumption masks on them, you know, VO2 max uh, mask and uh, measuring energy consumption. And they had kangaroos hop at three meters per second, and they had them hop at six meters per second. So that's about, six and a half miles an hour and 13 miles an hour, roughly. And they kangaroos burn the same amount of energy hopping twice as fast. So if you went out on a run today and, and you were to say, I'm gonna run a mile and I'm gonna run at six miles an hour, that's a 10 minute mile. But now I'm gonna go run 13 miles an hour. Now I'm gonna go run a mile in uh, five minutes compared to 10 minutes. Probably gonna burn a lot more energy, right? Kangaroos burn the same amount of energy. And it's not because they have more white fast twitch muscle fiber. We thought that was the case. It's not the case. It's because they use their Achilles tendon and their free energy from their, their connective tissue system to propel them faster without using more muscle. They use the muscle more in an isometric fashion when they hop faster, not in a contraction fashion. So that's proven. They also measured 10,000 meter runners and they looked at world class guys and those guys right below them, right just a smidge below sub world class. And they looked at about halfway through the race, the uh, sub world class runners, their hips would begin to uh, undulate more at 5,000 meters. So if you're running and you're strong, you're not, you're not going up and down too much. You're kind of level because when your foot hits the ground, you're bracing, you're strong, you're using that free energy. We're the only bipeds that have uh, this, this, this connective tissue energy or free energy. And the world-class uh, you know, 10,000 meter runners, their hips weren't undulating as much, so they're not using as much muscle compared to the people that fatigued halfway through the race where their hips started to sink down, so now they gotta get more concentric contraction 
more than they normally would if they had that bracing ability and had more of that free energy contribute to each run. So I, I'll use this as an example. If I have this, uh, this weight, right, this five pound weight, and I'm here doing this, I'm gonna fatigue you know, after a while. You know, I'll do this for a few minutes, but then I use free energy, right? See, that's free energy. That elastic provides free. We have this in our body. Connective tissue fascia is made, it works just like this. Now the connective tissue around like our Achilles tendons is more like this, collagen. Um, the connective tissue around your stomach, which expands and contracts, is more elastin. You know, it's a different type of collagen uh, fiber or collagen protein. Um, because, and women, when you have birth, guess what? You, you're hoping for a lot of elastin in your hips, in those, in those, uh, in those joints that have to expand and contract, because that's all, that's all connective tissue um, that, that you know, holds us together, that expands and contracts. So with, the, with the, um, a lot of the research that's come out, what, what are some of the ways that people are applying that? And, and are there any, is, it, is it mainly things that they're looking at in elite sport first because that's where there's, the money is? Or are they looking at, at you know, how people, regular people can be looking at, at training programs? Because I know you, you, you had your initial book, which is about fascia, and then yeah. the second one that you're working on, which yeah. is how to apply yes. that into, into exercise. So if there was some relatively straightforward ways of sort of boiling that down. What's, what's some of the application that we're learning in, in, in terms of, I guess, most of the, the people yeah. that listen today? Well, well, you know what's interesting is a, what, a lot of what you do here at Escape is, is fascia training because it's, it's omnidirectional submaximal loading. See, that's the magic phrase to training connective tissues, omnidirectional submaximal. Everything you do with these sandbags, like all this equipment is, is to me, medicine balls. Like you're not building muscle. Like, you think about it. Like, you're not making a bigger muscle when you do this stuff, right? All right, so kind of what are you doing? Like, you're conditioning the muscle. Like, they're, get, they're getting work. But what else is getting work is the connective tissues to help stabilize and support them. Because it's, like, it's the farm kid. It's working on the farm. You're doing chores. That's what keeps our mobility. It's that construction worker that, that can continue to move at 50 or 60 years old. You know, that somebody sitting in an office and he's 60... Like, you know, I mean, if, and if he moved with good hygiene, that construct, if he moved with bad hygiene, that construction worker is going to be banged up. But if that construction worker really understood good high speed, uh, movement hygiene and spine hygiene, he's going to, he's just still going to be able to move pretty good when he's, you know, 60, 70 years old. I know, I know construction guys that still move really good. They still work in 60, 70 because they always move pretty well. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, some maximal loading omnidirectional, that is, is fascia. Now, all systems are always in play, right? I mean, cardio, muscular, nervous system, fascia, connective tissue, endocrine system, all these systems are working in different ways when we train. It's what's working more. You know, what's, you know, if you go out for a run, cardio is working more, right? You go for a distance run. If I'm in the weight room doing a bench press, the muscular system's really working, right? Um, so they're, all systems are working. It's what's more. Now, you know, the muscular and fascia system are intertwined, right? So, but when I do things omnidirectional, so maximal loading, sandbags, med balls, things like that, kettlebells, things like that, omnidirectional movements, you know, more, more connective tissue is in play, like more fascia type elements are, are in play. I'm not gonna say it's the majority. I, you know, I can't even like identify, oh, I'm doing more fascia. No, you're training everything, cardio still working, nervous system, muscular. But now we know, hey, that, that's gonna respond. Like there's gonna be a response to our connective tissue system based on this type of training. Like we're gonna build a healthier connective tissue system, which really provides our, our movement, our fluid, fluidity, right? And then we also know bouncing movements, you know, is gonna create, and that comes to my tensegrity conversation, which I don't know if you wanna go there. Come I don't on, know if, yeah. you, if you want Let's, me to go in. Let's do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the body's really a big tensegrity uh, uh, model, right? Tensegrity concept. So this is a tensegrity model. So Buckminster Fuller, uh, who is a, you know, architect by trade, engineer, um, you know, kind of came up with this concept where it's uh, compression held together with tension, right? Compression held together with tension. So the, these wooden struts are, are compression 
you know, elements, you know, compressed, right? And now they don't touch one another. And, but they're held together. They're somewhat stable, but it's flexible. Stable, but flexible. So this is stable, but flexible. And, and this is really how the human body works and how it got to the human body and how we kind of now know how, you know, our bodies respond to forces and, and why kids are less likely to get injured if, if little Johnny falls down the stairs compared to grandma falling down the stairs, right? Well, a lot has to do with, with the connective tissue system, right? Because the connective tissue system as we age, we know fascia is 90%, you know, water and we know we become more dehydrated as we age. That's why our skin, our collagen changes and, you know, becomes more you know, like a prune, right? And it's not as dynamic and you know, just like your skin, right? It changes, right? So same thing with our muscles. Think about that. They become like our skin. They pull easier, they're more likely for injury and whatnot. Um, but understanding compression with tension, dynamic um, uh, stability, if you will, you, this uh, spine surgeon, Stephen Levine, was in the Natural Museum of History in DC about, I don't know, 50 years ago, I think it was, or maybe a little bit longer. Uh, he was studying dinosaurs, just happened to be there, this, this orthopedic spine surgeon, and he was looking at this dinosaur, and he said, mathematically, he looked at this dinosaur, he was kind of, there's no way this dinosaur has enough muscle to hold his head up. Like, this, this just doesn't make sense. So he came out, and outside the museum, he sat down, and he saw this tensegrity model, and that's where biotensegrity was born. You see, where our body is, is very similar to this tensegrity model, because we don't really have 300-plus muscles. My good friend and, Tom, and colleague Tom Myers says, we have one muscle in 300 pockets. And they all work as one, if, if we're healthy. One muscle in 300 plus individual pockets. And when we talk about tensegrity or biotensegrity, you know, how this concept works, because the bones are the wooden struts here, and the muscles, the fascia, the tendons, and the ligaments are the elastic components. Right, And we know if I have a tight hip, well, guess what? My foot might be out of alignment. So here's my foot down here, you know, how I have a tight area in one part of my body, a completely different area of my body now, the mechanics are altered. And that's because of biotensegrity. So understanding this now and looking at where the fascia gets bound up or tight or the hip gets locked into place because we sit like this all day, now those little spiders are around our hip joint, locking it down. And now I think I'm good, but now I have a little bit of external rotation. I go out and run my couple miles every day, or you know, I go do my six, seven miles a week, or I, cert I do a certain thing every day. Eventually, that's gonna move down the food chain and, and, and put an undue stress on a ligament or, or, or a tendon somewhere and cause, and cause an injury. So um, you know, this, this concept is really interesting. I'm always a big believer in uh, visuals. So, I mean, that's, that's how it works. And, and understanding this when we train and understanding like when we run and we bounce and my foot hits the ground, we have this big reaction that this everything in the body is, is kind of, you know, absorbing it. You know, your foot hits the ground when you run or when you jump, it, it's going through the entire system. That's why when you do bouncing activity, I think it's very healthy uh, for the human body because when we bounce, you're triggering this, this almost like this vibration or this, this stressor in your body that all, this, all these elastic components need to be strong so things just don't fall all over the place, right? Inside our organs, all our muscles, everything that stabilizes us. So doing some types of controlled bouncing, you know, just easy like up and down, like easy for six minutes a day, a couple of days a week could be life-changing for people, life-changing. And Keith Barr has done a lot of research. It's uh, 15 uh, grams of uh, collagen with 50 milligrams of vitamin C. You're going to increase collagen development, uh, you know, almost twofold uh, compared to without taking that collagen one hour before the workout. So with um, just with that, well, just to jump in on there. So if there was a few things that you could do um, to improve your, your 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 health of your fascia. What, yeah. would, what, would, what would be some very simple things we could do? You mentioned one, which is the, the, the jumping up and down, but are there any things you could do? And, and how often should we, in a week, be doing some form of fascia training? 
Yeah, I mean, there's different forms of, of quote unquote fascia training. Like, so just just bouncing up and down, like jumping rope or just like you know trampoline, you know the things you do. Like this, the science shows you know as as little as twice a week for six minutes, you're gonna get some benefit, you know, from that. Like think about the the world population. How many people bounce around for six minutes twice a week? Not many, right? And it could be it could be life changing. Now I'm just saying control. But as you get more, um, as you do more. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad, but there is a limit where you you know you, you can you can you know overdo, especially the age and 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 limitations. So just just balancing type movements are important, right? In in the program, but controlled movements. The other type of things we can be doing is everything that you do. Like these tools are all fascia related tools, medicine balls, you know, the different kettlebells, the sandbags, all the things that you have. Um, the the one tool here, uh, I, what do you call this tool? Core momentum trainer. Yeah, yeah, the core, the core momentum. I mean, that's huge. You know, all that is related, because what are you doing? You're doing all different directions, and you're stopping it, you're managing momentum, but in multi-plane motions. So all that multi multi-plane motions is what's, you know, creating this holistic effect, is what's giving you more stability and, and joint dynamics, because you're creating more joint stability, so the joint's gonna be more free to express strength at different areas, and that's huge for athleticism, that's just huge for health, right. to be able to move around and maintain. So the traditional sagittal plane stuff, the squat, the bench, the, you know, just like me in speed training, you figured it out, but you didn't know you figured it out, <laughs> like with, with escape training. Like you figured it out, but you're doing it, now, now there's science that's showing, hey, now you know, hey, why, you're doing now you know why, because yeah. now we're creating this, this saran wrapping, because fascia is really like, a, you know, basically like a, like a plastic, right? So like your, your fascia around your, uh, around your muscles, around individual muscles is like this plastic. So what's important is that we know, you know this can be you know, developed and it can be stronger. And as we get older, like this wraps the individual muscle cell, right? It wraps groups of muscle cells. It wraps entire muscles. It wraps groups of muscles. And things like ART, Say, okay, we're gonna work on you because your, your groups of muscles are stuck and we're gonna get them unstuck. Well, guess what? When you look at individual muscle cells or you look at a group of muscle cells, it's wrapped by something called the perimyosin, which wraps groups of muscles deep in the muscle. That gets stuck too. And so omnidirectional training and just pressure can help relieve that. Uh, so it's really, the, it, you know, not, to bring it down, to keep it simple, it's the power of movement an omnidirectional movement and the power of loaded omnidirectional movement. And so, so, in, on, so in like where you have like your strength training and your cardio, what, what you probably should consider is having, you know, maybe one or two times a week where you're, you're kind of focusing on training for your fascia, which is omnidire omnidirectional yes. loaded movement. Yeah, of Every, some kind. everything you do in your escape Training, you know, a right. good part of what you do is, is, is really addressing connective tissues, keeping ranges of motion, going into motions you typically don't get because you're locked in this constant, you know, position all day, right? This static position. And we need to move in multi-directions to keep our joints and uh, our body healthy, keeping blood flow. Like we all know that blood flow, the different joints and blood flow through the muscle. We all not get the waste products out, get the lymph moving out of this out of the, the, the cells and, and getting it you know, all drained and bringing in new fresh blood and you know, nutrients and oxygen, all these important elements that our cells need. Um, but it's this connective tissue stuff that is uh, really a new understanding that, hey, this is a major player. Like what we're doing here, it, it's playing a major role uh, in our health and, it, and, and, and the, um, the nerve endings and and, 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 and you know, now the science is showing it's a massive communication network. Yeah, I was gonna say that. You mentioned that before. They, they all kind of speak to each other yeah. through your whole... Is it, it, a lot, lot of science is coming out now showing that. I mean, we used to think, well, we know athleticism, right? When we respond, I, if I stand on this box and jump down, well, I know that that signal from, to contract my muscle is gonna go from my, you know, my, my lower body to my spine and, and right back, not to my brain, because I'm not gonna, You'll, you'll collapse, right? Because I have to contract super fast when I, when I jump off a box or if I trip and my body you know, you know, goes forward and my foot hits the ground, well, it's gonna, it's gonna contract and that goes right to my spine and back and it happens really, really quick. But now there's thought that 
the fascia because of the nerve endings. Um, and when I, when I land from the, uh, the trip or I jump off the box, what happens? I create a co-contraction. I create a pulse of stiffness to create isometric stiffness so I don't get hurt. Now there's, there's more research coming out about how that communication doesn't even go to the spinal cord. It's the fascia that communicates to the muscles in that local joint to create co-contraction and high amounts of stiffness uh, really quick really super quick and you see that with your elite athletes you know these guys that are incredible soccer players that can move like beyond comprehension uh, or these incredible athletes that can do certain things it's it's so fast it's even faster than we think that the the, the message travels to the spinal cord and back is more at the local level and potentially that could be the fascia that's facilitating that great so we're going to open it up for a few questions. Um, that was a huge, like, I've, I've, master's uh, degree in, uh, <laughs> in fascia. Uh, Kim? Well, I'm super excited because I was super stressed that I was going to have no questions for you. Um, so I really enjoyed this a lot. Um, it's amazing. I, this has been, I'm so happy that I got to sit in on this. Um, but I, and I've worked a lot with strength and conditioning coaches, so I'm just so curious your perspective when you have athletes come here and they've worked with you and they've put in all this time and being able to train fascia in that way, and then they go to maybe a standard university that may have a more old school strength and conditioning coach that wants the bench and they want the deadlift and they want the squat. Yep. Then they come back to you and you're like, what happened to you? Yeah. I just am so curious when, when do you think the, that you know, strength and conditioning coaches are going to start to catch up? And I think it may be, you know, with age, some of our older coaches are, you know, retiring. But it's just, when do you think that mentality is really going to start to shift? Because that's what keeps our athletes healthy, right? It's interesting. That's a great question. I have this conversation almost on a weekly basis. Um, and I think it's sometimes old school coaches are stuck in their ways. It was successful for them, so it's hard for them to change. They've been successful a certain way. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a real challenge, though, in the industry today, in, in performance. Uh, at the college level, high school level, not so much at the pro level, um, but at, at those levels, it's a real challenge. I, we still fight. I mean, this is, this is also pretty new coming out. This information is still really young. It's less than 10 years old, like a lot of stuff I just shared. Uh, some of that is, is, is relatively new. I just came back from the Fascia Research Congress. I'm, I'm a board member on the uh, Fascia Research Society. It's the largest nonprofit of, of, of a group of the top scientists in the world. They collaborate. We just had a conference in Montreal. But it's now that you know it's, it's promoting it, it's myself it's promoting it, getting it out there, getting people to understand it, and people with an open mind, you know, people, you know, coaches. Um, I, you know, it's a tough thing, I think, with, with our athletes. Uh, when they go to a university, if they have an old school strength coach, it's, it's a challenge. Like, it, it is a challenge. You got to kind of manage it. Um, in my first book, you know, it's in my book, uh, Chris Sims. He was the number one high school quarterback uh, in the country. Um, we trained him. This is, this is 99 and um, went to the University of, University of Texas um, and, and went out there and, uh, you know, they, they did a lot of, uh, he left us jumping about 29 inches in the vertical jump, running a, you know, probably a 4'9", 40. Um, he was 6'4", 210 pounds, you know, traditional quarterback. Um, you know, you know, pocket passer, and wasn't slow, but four, you know, four nine was pretty good for a high school, you know, eighteen year old, six four high school, eighteen year old. Well, he came back four years later, running a five three, and vertical jump in twenty two, and uh, you know, just did a lot of traditional training. Now we had to unwind all that training for the combine, so that was a lot of manual work. Uh, we didn't weight train him for three months. And uh, we un unwound all that stiffness in him in a, in a few months, and he wound up running about, I think, a 4.8 uh, at the combine and, and jumped probably close to you know, 29 or, or close to 30 in that range. So got him back to his high school numbers, which were pretty good. And, and for a quarter, he still got drafted third round and went to Tampa Bay and played. But he says in the book, yeah, man, there was a lot of things that were. Now, that's back, back then. Uh, stool coaches are still like that. Um, but unfortunately, too, interesting, another element of fascia with Chris is that in a game at Tampa Bay, he, he actually won the um, NFC South as the starting quarterback for Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He was back to pass and got hit with a helmet right in his spleen, ruptured his spleen, didn't know it, played the whole game, continued the game, 
and realized at the end of the game he was not doing well. They had immediate surgery, brought him in, you know, had surgery, you know, cut off his uniform. It was pretty crazy. And then um, that was 2006 when that happened. And uh, they didn't really know much about fascia then, the surgeons and, and how he healed up in his recovery process uh, down there with Tampa. But we know, I talked about Thomas Roller, that fascia, sling, frontal, superficial front line. Well, there was no regard to how they cut him open. It was, you know, obviously emergency surgery, but also his healing process. There was no, you know, uh, the therapy, I guess, that he got, not I guess, but the, was not the best. So he never overcame that fascia development or the, 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 what the incision did to his fascia. And he lost that recoil and he could really never throw the football effectively again. Uh, the way he used to throw. And it wasn't from a muscle strength standpoint, it was from that free energy. So re from a recovery standpoint, all these things we know now, uh, how, how, we would, how would we train differently? But the college coaches, it's funny because Chris did, you know, he told me, he's like, a lot of the wide receivers would make believe they're injured and not do a lot of that crazy conditioning or lifting. And they, they went out to the combine and just blew out the numbers uh, because they were, you know, they were peaked. I have, this, I have this conversation often. I mean, I work with Catapult, GPS tracking company. Uh, they're in almost every major. They're in 3,500 pro teams and college teams. So it's GPS tracking uh, technology where the athletes wear a GPS unit and we can track their speed, we can track their distance covered, their sprint distance, we can track their accelerations, their decelerations. We can track uh, all this information with athletes. And, um, you know, just, just you know, we have an issue, I think, where just a lot of athletes are overtrained. They're over practiced, they're over conditioned, they're over trained. And um, like GPS tracking is helping us now a lot. I got this unit on my son's high school football team, and uh, which is a high level, high level team here in New Jersey, number one team in New Jersey right now, number 40 in the country, 45 in the country. And, um, you know, 14 kids have D1 offers on the team. And the coach is a great coach. He's hardcore, old school. And you know, run, run, he was running him a lot. And now we got GPS tracking. And now it's amazing because you'll see the receivers, um, you know, during conditioning, the wide receivers will be sitting stretching because they practiced all day running 50 sprints. They ran 50 routes, you know, you know sprinting, running routes. They did more running and, and sprinting than the team did by two, even without the conditioning. So, so, you know, technology, hopefully, the answer, hopefully going to help us, you know, understand this more. You spoke about teaching the fundamentals of speed to the athletes. Does that look the same across the board for different types of athletes? So um, is it the same fundamentals for a wrestler, a football player, a tennis player? What does that look like when you have to learn? Yeah, a lot depends on training age and where that athlete is in their cycle and their sport. So when athletes come in, like we, we, we teach them all the fundamental movements of speed, right? I mean, just the, just the fundamental. But as you get older and depending on the, the level you're at um, and what your goals are, you know, we're going to modify that. So, uh, you know, a, uh, a field or court sport athlete is going to have a lot of multi-directional speed in their training. A track athlete is going to have more linear speed training. A wrestler is going to have more, you know, explosive strength training. And, 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 you know, fundamental strength training in, in, their, in their program. Um, so it's very sport dependent and athlete training age dependent. So that's the important thing, training age. And also maturity and, and, and maturation in terms of, you know, how we load the athlete. You know, we're going to load them differently as they get older compared to when they're younger. So, yes, there is, there is a specific uh, training, you know, approaches based on their sport their training age, you know, and their goals and, and their needs, right? So the needs analysis is important. We evaluate every athlete that comes in here. We run them in the 10, the 20, the 40. We see their acceleration, their top end speed. We look at their multi-directional speed, their deceleration, their running form, their, you know, their lower body power through vertical jump testing. We, we have force plates here. We test them on, on force plates. And then we, uh, you know, we look at their, you know, their overall movement literacy and then build a program around that. And the program is comprised of, you know, linear speed training, multi-directional speed and strength training and, and then, you know, obviously the, the, the fascia-based stuff that we, we incorporate. I have another question. Oh, okay. Go on. Um, I know you have multiple facilities. Where did you decide to 
built um, is is it because someone in another city saying uh, asking you like hey can we can we get something going in this city or is that you looking across the states and saying oh that's a good market to yeah. Build or what was your yeah. No, our our model is really simple. I mean, where we are right now with our program, it's 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 a it's a license. So so we basically offer our program as a certification. So if you want to get it's very similar to CrossFit. So if you want to get certified, it's a it's an online certification followed by a, a four day education with us here. Um, so you go online, you take the you know, take the, the six week program, then you come here for four days for the practical application, and then you're you're certified in our system. And then if you want to leverage and use our brand and continue with our education, you buy a license. And then you know so we we have individual coaches license, and then we have licenses for facilities that that say hey we want to use this as in our facility, uh, or we have an individual coach that that license our. Our, tech, our training and our education and our brand to just do it part time and go and uh, you know work with a high school a couple of days a week and make an extra thousand bucks a month or you know a couple hundred bucks a week because I'm training a high school team which is kind of fun that I go watch them on Friday night or I go to their games I'm really connected I know the kids um, I'm with them twice a week I'm kind of like the the team feels important they got their own strength and conditioning coach you know every kid throws a hundred bucks in you know and you get 20, 30 kids on the team, that's three grand. You're making that over two or three months. And you're you're putting in four or five hours a week. And that's kind of a part-time gig. And you want to do that full time, you do that 30 hours a week. Now you're making, you know, maybe four or five, six grand a month, you know, with 20 teams or 10 teams. So that's it's that simple. It's really the demand of the uh, of the coaches that come in. Because this industry, in my opinion, is a supply-driven industry. If, if you're really good and you know this stuff, you can go out and create demand. Because we give you the tools to go out and create that demand. Like we have, we've written multiple books. You know, there's ways to go and meet with a coach and say, hey, we got this system, the Parisi system. Here's a book. We have a you know 80,000 word book. Uh, that's a college textbook in speed, published by Human Kinetics that we just put out last year. So that's a huge, like, incredible brochure, like to give to a coach to break the ice. You know, it's this you know 300 page, four color. And that it's called the anatomy of speed. Everything I just discussed is in the book, but it's 200 references, scientific references. It's all compacted, and we we look at that as our as our ultimate, you know, brochure to give to a coach to to create credibility. I've got two more, um, Michael. Yeah, Bill, your your passion and your knowledge <coughs> is really inspirational. So oh, thank, thank you. you to be able to get that information where I can accept it as a knucklehead. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Um, and I never thought I'd be so uh, excited about fashion. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, certainly after this, I, you've encouraged me to train in a in a very different way. So awesome. uh, pretty cool. Really, yeah. fa just fascinating. Uh, but one thing I did, and you did mention something about intaking certain foods or vitamins. So I'm just curious, do you train your athletes to have a certain diet or certain types of food that you encourage them to have or not have? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think my whole career has been about fundamentals, right? And just doing the basics. And, and that starts with hydration, you know. And, and, and think about what, what we're dealing with in terms of our society, right? We, we just uh, still got to go, we have to have a long way just to hit the fundamentals. Drinking enough water, getting just kids or athletes, people, just to drink enough water every day is the first step, right? And then at the, the next point is just managing the processed sugar, you know? So it's, it's, it's hydration and it's processed sugar, the two like big elements that we're all, like we coach kids and have them do. We, we're not giving out these complex diets. I mean, but those are the first two elements and let's yeah. take it a little bit at a time. Let's make sure we do this. I'm not saying not to eat processed sugar, I'm saying manage it, like special occasions, celebrations, Sunday, something like that. You know, you don't want to get your calories from that. And then from there, you know, it's, you know, managing your lean protein. It's, you know, eating three, four times a day at the minimum, you know, uh, managing your blood sugar with that. And then, you know, obviously carbs, you know, we, I think we, we, we got too far off the, the rail with, uh, you know, no carbs, you know, you know, we need carbs. Carbs are fuel, right? But quality carbs, right? So just, just balanced diet, good nutrition in terms of ergogenic aids, things like that, you know, yeah, we do say, hey, collagen, you know, is important. My son takes collagen, my, you know, it's, it's an hour before the workouts, you know, it's 15 grams, 
with a little, you know, small glass of orange juice. We hit that. We use creatine, you know. Um, you know he's 18 now, so he's at that level. We'll get a little benefit from some, uh, you know, creatine that we'll take on a consistent basis. Um, you know, that, that pre-workout. Folks. That's uh, creatine's in the morning. We'll just take that, but the, uh, the collagen, you know, typically would be, uh, you know, an hour before the workout or now that he's in school, take that in the morning. You know, multivitamin pack he'll yeah. take. Um, uh, you know, other than that, you know, those are, the, those are the big ones. And they're just being really locked in to your, you know, to your other, you know, 20, you know 12 hours a day that you're eating or whatnot, being locked in and making good choices and, and staying hydrated and, uh, you know, knowing that, you know, hey, bananas, you know, before workouts are, are really great, you know, especially if they're sweating a lot, you know, getting that potassium. Gatorade is not horrible. You know, Gatorade got a bad rap over the years uh, because of oh, sugar, sugar. Well, certain kids that are lean, that are burning a lot of calories, they need that, right? Now, if you're overweight trying to lose weight, and you got, you know, you're, 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 you, know you don't need that, right? You got to be smart. And I see, I see kids cramping. They're, they don't have enough electrolytes in their system, and they're, like, all locked up. So you just got to manage it. And then the last thing I'll say is like, you know, that aura ring, I mean, sleep, my, my, my kid has the, wears the aura ring, you know, he's like managing sleep hygiene. He's, you know, looking at his REM sleep. He's looking at how much deep sleep he got. And it's really hitting the fundamentals, you know, um, and that's my world, right? So I, I haven't gotten, we, we don't go too, too deep because we're dealing more with the masses. And even with my son, who's, you know, he's a senior this year. He's going to play Division One football next year. Um, you know, we'll dial in the nutrition a little bit more, but I think doing what he's doing and continuing with that. Um, and there's some other things I probably can look into that I personally probably still need to learn a little bit more about that we can do. But I know we're going to get into some, some testing. I know there's a lot of technology out there now about, you know, testing your, you know, your uh, hormone levels and just testing recovery and you know, managing the endocrine system and understanding, you know, just to kind of get a better read if you're overtraining, undertraining, kind of getting an understanding of, of, of where that, that, that threshold is at, you know. So I know there's some more science out there um, around that, like blood flow restriction, like there's things like you can do to, to help accelerate, you know, muscle recovery without loading a, you know, a joint system. So there's things that are out there that, uh, you know, we're still looking at. So last question, Andy, I know you was... Uh, yeah, came. No, sorry, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. So I would say to Mark, I've, I've read your books. And oh, I, thank yeah, you. I, I, I take so much away from them. Um, but my background is Olympic weightlifting. And um, I kind of... It's, it's more about a question about... That I think athletic ability is, is huge when it comes to Olympic lifting. I think it's something that's forgotten now. We just teach the lifts. And so when I train someone to do Olympic lifts... I teach some of the exercises that you kind of prescribed to get people faster. Yeah. And I just wondered, have you trained anyone who's like an Olympic lifter or anything that does any sort of, not like field events, but um, like Olympic lifting or any strength events because of the athletic ability, that crossover? I don't know if that's something yeah, well, that you've done. Well, first, I, I'm a believer in the Olympic lifts. So I did them when I was an athlete. I actually went to an Olympic lifting, a weight, Olympic lifting coach and I got coached up on the clean and the, and, and the snatch. I didn't really mess much with the jerk because I did it for athleticism. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I believe in them. I think the challenge with them, though, in, in something maybe in our setting is you really need to be skilled and have a good eye for that. And I think, you know, if you do, um, then there's a lot of value there. If you have a bigger group in a larger setting, like some, in some of our classes, we don't do them. We do them one-on-ones and things like that, but you need that skilled eye. But the benefit is there. We, we believe in them. Um, you know, I, I, I feel the, the, the rate of force development in the Olympic lifts is, is the ideal of what you're trying to accomplish when you, you're putting force into the ground. You're, you're working that, that you know, force velo- velocity spectrum, um, generating you know, high amounts of force quickly. Uh, you're using that hip hinge motion, which is really important in athleticism, in the Olympic lifts, the snatch more so because you're more bent and flexed at the hips. The clean, you can get more weight because you're a little more upright. Uh, but, you know, I, I feel they're great, but I think the most important thing is, you know, obviously the technique, just like the squat. You know, if, you, if you're teaching it wrong or if, if they're doing it wrong, the risk becomes high, and then the risk-reward ratio is out of whack. 
right? You always have to, I always look at my athletes in training, what's the risk, what's the reward? You know, what are we trying to, what are we trying to accomplish here? You know, like what, you know, what is the risk? So I have a kid, he's, his technique is really, he's not getting it in the Olympic lifts for whatever reason. He's not strong enough, doesn't have a good enough base. We're not gonna do him. Like we'll do maybe broomstick, whatnot, but all right, how much, I only have an hour with this kid twice a week. Like where am I gonna get the biggest bang for my buck? Right now, if I have this kid three days a week or five days a week at two hours a clip, yeah, I'll spend some time trying to teach him the Olympic. I can, you know, put him on a, a resisted, you know, jumping apparatus, you know, like a Vertimax or something and, and get a similar kind of, you know, not a similar because I'm not getting the hip hinge, but, you know, there's other ways to skin the cat. You know, I can do deadlifts and do Vertimax. Like, so it's, it's a matter of return on time. Yeah. Like what's the return on time and what's the risk factor? All those play a big role, but I love the Olympic lifts. I think they're really important. Um, but and if you have the time and you can get a return on time, that that is. And if the kid is getting it and he's going to be with you. Yeah, no, I, no, I completely agree uh, because I think it's a bit like you because I'm I was, I'm a little guy and so my my thing was trying to find that how to get the movement better. So it was about creating speed and athleticism. So I'm doing a lot of stuff like strides and yeah. all that stuff because. I felt that was going to help my size to shift my weight. Yep. Because you always say to lift, it's like, you need to be faster. It's like, how do I get faster if you ask me to shift that, that weight? Whereas I was like, well, get the athleticism to then be able to get the movement to lift that heavier yeah. weight. So, yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, there's a lot more research coming out on velocity-based training and, uh, um, and the force velocity curve and understanding you know, force and velocity, right? It's an inverted relationship. The more force I put, the lower the velocity is going to be, and the higher velocity is, the lower force is going to be. So it's this force velocity curve, and lifting and athleticism is built around this force velocity curve, and understanding how to manipulate that, and and looking at your training. That's why this whole bar speed thing, this this new concept of, of velocity based training, measuring bar speed. You know, at meters per second. So we, you know, a lot of research is out there now. Bar speeds of less than a, a half a meter per second is is more strength based. And once you get above a half a meter per second, 0.75 meters per second is considered more, you know, strength speed. And then as you get faster, you know, one meter per second is more power speed strength. And as you get over 1.5 meters per second with bar speed, now you're working more, more, more speed of movement. So. That would be something you probably would benefit from, in terms of uh, for your Olympic lifting. Yeah. Looking at, you know, the whole velocity-based training with your traditional lifts, because to be a good Olympic lifter, you you got to have a good squat, good front squat. You know, there's all elements. But how fast you're doing that with the traditional movement, you, we can we can measure that now. Yeah. Like there's ways to measure that stuff, which I think adds to the athletic things you're doing, yeah. like to add to your Olympic lifting success. Yeah, I think we went over. I think, well, thank yeah. I think I don't think we did definitely by quite a bit. You I know. think we went. Uh, what was I mean? What, what time did we, we start? We did start a little bit later, but we uh, we've gone over. So hopefully you guys uh, found this useful. Bill, thank you so much. Uh, really I, appreciate it. I really, your time. yeah. Thank you, lady. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.